Um, well, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar featuring Richard Schuster, who is an MD and psychiatrist living in Honolulu, Hawaii. And um, Richard and I have been talking for a couple of years since he bought a mind mirror, and I have been watching with tremendous interest uh, his projects, one of which is uh, create, well, he'll tell you about it, but it's about clearing creative blocks through lucid dreaming and then working with people during mind mirror sessions. And uh, he has been working with seven people and has prepared a study that's under review right now. Uh, he is a professor at the University of Honolulu, uh, specializing in lucid dreaming. And of course, as a mind mirror community, uh, we are extremely interested in all of these subjects. And so it is with tremendous pleasure that we welcome you and gratitude also for your being with us uh, in this program. Well, thank you very much, Judith. Uh, years ago, I got interested in neurofeedback and my interest in the kind of routine neurofeedback was not all that enduring. But I discovered Anna Weiss in that process and reached out to her, became interested in her work. And unfortunately, by the time I got to know her, got to meet her, she was very much towards the end of her life. And so I kind of gave up in that whole area of study, just thought, well, that's not available, until I met Judith a couple of years ago. And there was probably, I don't know, a 10-year gap or something in between there. But anyway, Judith has been very helpful to me. And I'm very grateful to have been invited today. So I'm going to, first of all, uh, provide some theoretical background. Then I'm going to stop for questions and such. But if anyone has questions along the way, please feel free to ask them. So our topic is dreams, embodied imagination, and the creative mind. Now, we'll talk a little bit about dreams from different perspectives. Um, embodied imagination is the particular form of dream work that I use. It's not specifically lucid dreaming, but it, as we'll talk about it, it actually, I, I don't think of it as that, although it has some similarities and actually may be very similar. And the creative mind is probably my most passionate and, um, you know, lively source of interest. And the creative process itself is a source of great fascination for me. And it's, it's a wonderfully nebulous and mysterious kind of area. And, so if you leave this talk today with the sense that, I, oh, good, now I really understand creativity, I think I will have failed. <laughs> I don't think it's understandable in a way, at least not in a rational way. Okay, what do we have? So what's a dream? Um, I thought I would just share this. There's different perspectives on dreams, and I just thought I would, you know, in our modern world, we live, this is basically influenced by um, cultural anthropology. And ontology, of course, is the, the philosophical study about what is real. So from the perspective that we commonly have, monophasic culture, um, which is very heavily influenced since the 17th, 18th century by rational empiricism, we live in a singular reality. There's one reality. It's based upon observable, measurable, rational proofs. Well, dreams are irrational. So from this perspective, they're either meaningless or they need some kind of interpretation. You interpret the irrationality to make it rational and then you can have something useful. The implicit assumption here is the brain is like a computer, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, in contrast, we have a polyphasic culture, which is the traditional perspective that has been present for most of human history. It's still present in many indigenous cultures, Australian Aborigines, Native Hawaiians, Native Americans, where here we have multiple embedded realities where conventional reality is just one way of perceiving and experiencing. Just as this is a quote from the Upanishads, which is a Sanskrit, you know, Vedic text from almost 3,000 years ago. A person has two dwellings, this world and the world beyond. Between them lies the dream world, where the two worlds meet. So there's this idea, there's some kind of transcendent world, some kind of manifest world, that the dream world is actually in between those two worlds. So this is a very, very old idea, but it'll come back as we discuss what embodied imagination is, because it's, I think, one of the foundational principles there. The implicit assumption here is that the brain is an organ of perception. So if we consider the brain as a computer, then we start thinking of a dream being 
being turned on or turned off. So the brain is a computer. The dream occurs when information is st stored in memory. The brain's hard drive, so to speak, is turned on by changes in the brain. Now, there's many, many very sophisticated theoreticians in this area. Two of the main ones, Alan Hobson is a psychiatrist at Harvard who's dedicated his life to the study of dreams, particularly the neurophysiology. And he advocates kind of a bottom-up mechanism where he would say that simplifying beyond simplification, but basically the dream is generated by activity in the brainstem. The brainstem creates activity, it activates the cortex. The cortex tries to make sense out of this chaotic activity. That really, a dream doesn't really mean anything. It has little psychological relevance at all. Contrast that with Mark Soames, who is a neuropsychoanalyst from South Africa, who says, no, 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 wait a minute. Dreams are generated by the forebrain, so they have more psychological relevance because he studied people who have brain lesions that deactivate some of the areas that Hobson says are, are um, generative in terms of dreams, and people keep dreaming anyway. So his position is that dreams have psychological relevance. Let me just give us a contrast. So again, this is the turn on hypothesis. A dream is turned on by the brain. On the other hand, if we consider the brain as a perceptual organ, then we would consider what might be called a tune in hypothesis. That is that dreamlike activity is always present. In sleep, when external sensory inputs are not available and memory is not available, we call this a dream. In waking, when we have external sensory inputs, and memory remains engaged, we call this imagination, but that it's happening all the time. Again, the metaphor is like the picture, that the moon doesn't go away when the sun goes out, you just can't see it, but it's there. Now, waking consciousness is not typically tuned into dream activity, but as we'll see, it's very possible to do that. And there's many examples of dreams inspiring creativity, which we'll see in a moment. But if we think of things from this perspective, then, my mind starts going to questions. Well, okay, is being tuned into dreamlike activity while awake a fundamental feature of the creative mind? Is that one of the foundations of what it is to be creative? In waking, you're tuned into dreamlike phenomena. Also, I think relevant to this group in, in this presentation is being tuned into dreamlike activity while awake, analogous to what Maxwell Cave described as an awakened mind. And I think it probably is, at least that's what I was thinking. Let me just say a few things about dreams and creativity. There's wonderful examples of this. Auguste Kekulé, who was a German chemist in the 1800s, discovered the chemical structure of benzene. He was giving a keynote address to the German Chemical Society. He was already a well-established, famous chemist about how he discovered that benzene was a ring-like structure. And he had been working on this for weeks and months, trying to figure it out. And on a particular day, he was working from morning till night, working, 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 trying to rationally figure this out. He, he was exhausted, couldn't figure it out, fell into a, a sleep, into a slumber. And he had a dream. In this dream, carbon molecules like snakes are appearing in front of his eyes. And he's watching these carbon atoms like snakes, when all of a sudden, one of the snakes grabs its tail and starts whirling menacingly in front of his eyes. He wakes up in a start and says, that's it. Benzene is a ring. Spends the rest of the night trying to, you know, verify the hypothesis. Paul McCartney, yesterday some would say is the, you know, the finest popular song ever written. The melody came to McCartney in a dream. As did actually the lyrics for Let It Be, or partially the lyrics. That line in, in Let It Be, Mother Mary Came to Me, refers to Paul's biological mother, not to a religious figure. Uh, Paul's mother had died. He was going. He was in a very bad time in his life, trying to figure things out, struggling with this or that. And he had this dream where his mother presented to him and said, "Paul, let it be." And that became the song. Just a few others quickly. Otto Louis won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for discovering nerve transmission as chemical, not electrical. The methodology for the Nobel Prize-winning uh, experiment came in a dream. The composer Giuseppe Tartini's finest piece of work was the Devil's Trill Sonata, where a devil appeared in a dream, sat on his bed with a violin and plays the, played this astonishing piece of music that he tried to copy. And Robert Louis Stevenson, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde mostly came from Stevenson's dreams. If we just look at the creative process for a moment, 
This is Graham Wallace's classic description of the creative process. Wallace was an interesting guy. He started the London School of Economics. This model has been around for almost for 90 years or so, and it's still used today by creativity researchers. There's, first of all, a preparation phase. All of us are familiar with this. If you're doing anything, if you're working on a project, there is the rational kind of grunt work of just doing your work, preparing, trying to figure out, and all the rest of it. But then it oscillates between conscious and unconscious processes, something that Wallace called incubation. Some unconscious process begins that then turns into illumination, like Kekulé. Working, working, working on benzene, has a dream, boom, benzene is a ring. And then he spends the rest of the night trying to verify the hypothesis. So most of the examples I gave you came spontaneously. My interest is here to say, can you actually very deliberately facilitate the incubation process by doing something, by using dreams? Can you create a structure where, where you could not wait for this to happen randomly, but rather try to facilitate this process? And the, the method that I use is called embodied imagination, which I think could be described as a neo Jungian form of dream work. It's created by Robert Bosnick, who was a Jungian analyst. And Robert has used this process in creative ways, but you know, he's one of these wild, creative people who don't want to study things very much. He just does things. So, but he worked with a woman named Janet Sonnenberg, who was the director of theater. At, at MIT, and they developed this way of working with actors using this embodied imagination. And she wrote a book called Dream Work for Actors, if any of you are interested in that. And they took this all over the place. They took this methodology to the Royal Shakespeare Company in England and on and on. Robert is from the Netherlands, but he lives in Los Angeles now. and He works with actors there. He works with Stanford in their engineering department trying to help them engage creative processes. Now, embodied imagination is different. It's not the same as regular dream work. If you go to most dream specialists today, you'll have dream analysis. There will be a very wise dream an analyst who will tell you what your dreams mean. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I found that very useful. I was in Jungian analysis for years, and I found it interesting, useful, fun. This is different. There's no analysis at all. The first thing is that you're in a dual consciousness state of awareness. So you want to take a dream and then rest yourself back into the dream. Now you do that by slowing down and being very meticulous about sensualizing. Just waiting, waiting, waiting. Go back into the dream until the atmosphere of the dream is completely surrounding you, until you feel like you're in the dream right now. But of course you're awake at the same time. So you're now in waking consciousness, but you're tuned into dreamlike consciousness, right? And then, it's about direct engagement with dream images. It's non-interpretive. There's no interpretation involved. The way that Robert came to regard dream images is that they're independent sources of intelligence. And he was very influenced by Henri Corbin, who was a French scholar. He had, he's long deceased, but he had a position at the Sorbonne. And he came up with this concept that he called the Mundus Imaginalis, which is almost the same as what I shared with you earlier in terms of the uh, Upanishads, this idea that there's a dream world between a transcendent world and a manifest world is a dream world. So it's a radical departure from the usual way we look at dreams. For Henri Corbin, for Robert, for embodied imagination, dream images are independent sources of intelligence that have an ontological reality. They're not figments of the imagination. You're entering into a world, what Henri Corbin called the imaginal world or the mundus imaginalis. This is a bit long, but just let me read this to you. This is Robert's description of what is a dream image. This is from his book, Embodiment. If any of you want to know more, it's a, it's a short book, but it describes all of this very well. So what are dream images? What are the substantive images that embody their own intelligence? They aren't reconstructed memories or day residues, even though they sometimes dress themselves in the events of the day. According to the visionary studied by Henri Corbin, there are forms of intelligence which present themselves to the perceiving eye of the creative imagination. Now, Corbin, his life's work was in esoteric Islam, so he became a student of Sufism. Before the revolution, he actually had a center in Tehran. In Sufism, there's a well-developed uh, understanding of visionary experience, of imaginal experience. So, you know, this is... Uh, 
that the forms of intelligence which present themselves to the perceiving eye of the creative imagination, they, they're just talking about the Sufis now, consider this realm of substantive images to be as real as the physical world perceived by the senses. It is the real world between matter and spirit, between body and mind, a real world of creative imagination, which dropped out of Western awareness around the 13th century, and in an eighth century long mental march, turned into its opposite in the contemporary notion of the imaginary. Imagination is the opposite of reality. So for Corbin, for Robert, for people in embodied imagination, um, dream images are, are um, you know, these are subtle bodies. They're, it's a way of entering into a world, an imaginal world, that contains bodies that contain their own intelligence. Let me go back to just give you an example. Let's just say you have a dream, and I'm making up this dream now. I dream that I'm in a forest and I see a, a bear attacking my sister. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rest myself down until I feel I am back in this forest where I can sense this forest, where I can sense the temperature of it, I can see the forest, I can, I use my sort of the, the dream body to start sensing into this environment so that I become more and more involved in the dream trying as much as possible to recreate the atmosphere of the dream in this moment. And then I turn my attention to the dream ego, the, the, the ego that is there, the dream body that is there in the forest. And I pay particular attention to the physicality of this dream body. How is it standing? What is it feeling? And then I'm starting to watch the dream. There is a bear, there is a sister, and I'm becoming more and more involved with what is this experience like. Then I'm paying particular attention to how this experience exists in this dream body. So let's just say, excuse me, that I discover that I'm terrified, that in my gut there is terror. I then pay all attention now to the physical sensation of this terror, and I anchor this feeling in my body, right? In the dream body, which will feel like my body while I'm telling the dream. Then, and this will sound odd to the waking mind, but to the imaginal mind, this happens very easily. Then I perhaps start to pay attention to the bear. I start to notice the bear, the particularity of the bear, how this bear is positioned, start to get more and more intimate with the, with the consciousness of this bear until I slowly am drawn into the bear's consciousness. Um, and then I begin to experience from the inside, so to speak, what is happening with this bear. Well, you know, as the waking ego would think, this must be a vicious bear, and maybe I find that, maybe I find viciousness here. It's also possible that, that I discover this kind of immense power, this enormous creature, and perhaps I feel the immense power and capacity in its jaws, and I, then I turn my attention to the jaws, and I anchor the sensibility in the jaws, as an example. The important thing is you don't know before you do that what's going to happen. Your waking mind can't tell you this. So you're discovering this in the dream as it happens, not anything that you think is going to happen. Then, so now I have two anchor points. One, my dream ego, I'm terrified in the gut, the bear, enormous capacity in the jaws. Then I turn my attention to the sister. Well, I don't know what I'll find in the sister. I may find that she too is terrified. I may find that she is in some complete condition of surrender, where she is in complete peace, that life is unfolding in this way, and that she's fine, she's okay, she's surrendering to whatever happens, happens, I'm not worried about it. Whatever that experience is, then I anchor that. So I leave this dream se session now with three anchors. Now you could have 10 anchors. Dreams have so many images, you have to become very selective, what am I gonna do with them? You could embody the forest here if you wanted. But anyway, in this example I'm giving, there's three anchors. There's a dream ego, there's a bear, there's a sister. And then I simply continue to feel these things in my body. So it's an alchemical process. I'm not trying to understand the dream. It's okay to understand it later. If one wants to later on discuss how interesting it is that this happens, fine. But the initial process is simply to sense in a somatic way over and over and over again. So the instruction I give people is sense this for 20 minutes a day. Not all at once, but just keep going back to the somatic anchors again and again. I'm washing the dishes. I sense it for 30 seconds. I'm driving my car. I'm sensing it for a minute. But I just keep going back to it again and again and again and again. And then, typically what you do is sense it before you go to sleep at night and have this incubate the next dream so that you now set up a series of dreams. So that's the process.
I know that many of you here could probably present this in a more sophisticated way than I could, but let me just bring us back to the awakened mind. So Kate proposed that this is a, a mind that's present in creative and accomplished people across any discipline. And the interesting thing about Kate, of course, is that he said, and I can measure this neurophysiologically, electroencephalographically, that there is some kind of proportional relationship between beta, alpha, theta, and delta waves. What I would say is that in, in Kate's awakened mind, there's the same kind of phenomenon happening. There's a waking awareness that is now tuned in to a dreamlike awareness. If we consider that these EEG wave frequencies represent states of consciousness we have with beta waves, normal waking consciousness, what we you know, mostly have right now. If we close our eyes and relax a little bit, we're now into some kind of light meditative state, alpha rhythms become more prominent. If we're imagining in alpha, it feels subjective, right? So that I'm imagining, I'm resting, I'm imagining I'm at the beach, it's, I'm relaxing, it's great to be here, I really love it, you know, all of that. But there's a quality of me, subjectivity, that is present, it feels like I'm creating the images. As we go deeper into theta, now we're in a dreamlike state. In a dream, we don't feel like we're making the dream up. We are participating in something that is happening to us. Same thing if you're awake and you go into theta. All of a sudden, images start to become spontaneous, right? All of a sudden, there's images that are moving, and it doesn't feel like I'm making these images up. I'm just experiencing it, very dreamlike. And then, of course, if we go into delta, most people lose conscious awareness, of course. You know, very experienced meditators don't necessarily leave con lose conscious awareness in delta. In normal waking, we have predominance of beta and some gamma uh, here. But, you know, there's, there's a sense that there's, it's all the activity is here. This activity of alpha, theta, and, and delta much less so. Contrasted with an awakened mind where you have all of these levels of consciousness, so to speak, concurrently present. So you, again, from using the language I'm using here, you have waking consciousness pr present with dream consciousness through the sort of bridge of alpha. Theta is present with beta. Now, one of the things, you know, I think Cade's theories are so simple and so elegant and so explanatory, and neuroscience has exploded so that there was so much interest in states of consciousness in neuroscience. There's so much there. I don't know why nobody, it's to my knowledge, has ever taken Cade's theories and said, let's use all of the modern gadgets we have to see what we can learn about what he's saying. And that's unfortunate. So all we can draw is analogies. For instance, right now, those of you who are paying attention to what I'm saying, your executive control network is engaged. In executive control, this is a very schematic brain here, but your executive control network being a frontal parietal control network and a dorsal attention network, with your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex being the, more, the main hub. So when we are alert, paying attention, listening, focused on our external environment, this network is engaged, right? When our mind is wandering, right now, if you're thinking, when is this guy going to stop talking? I'm hungry, I want to go for lunch or dinner or breakfast, wherever you are in the world, then your default mode network is engaged. Dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, uh, um, posterior cingulate cortex, and all these other hubs. Now, these are anti-correlated. One turns on, the other turns off in, in normal circumstances. So you're either Either you're focused in attention, it's like doing focused attention meditation. You do focused attention meditation, this is what's turned on. If your mind starts wandering, it goes here. You're listening to the, the talk, you're in an executive control network. Your mind is wandering, you're in a default mode. But it's anti-correlated. One turns on, the other turns off, right? Except the interesting thing is, in the creative process, this is not so. So in the creative process, what we have is now these brain networks are coordinated. Those networks that are involved in alert and waking are now turned on at the same time as dream and imagination. Executive control network, default mode network turned on at the same time. They do these studies, and like, for instance, in, in jazz musicians when they're improvising. So if you're imp improvising in jazz, you are concurrently a, a composer and a performer. It's happening at the same time. Under those circumstances, these networks are turned on at the same time. Now, this is to me an Possibly another way of simply is there beta, alpha, theta, perhaps even delta turned on at the same time. So I started thinking, is this just the same thing as an awakened mind? Is create is that is that what's happening? 
And also, I wondered, is this dual consciousness state that we are evoking when doing embodied imagination, this form of dream work, are we evoking the same state? So I got to thinking about this, and I decided to try to study it. Now, I stay, say study very humbly because, you know, my work is mostly as a clinician. Um, this is not like some National Institute of Health Research project. This is much more like a mad scientist working in his basement, just because I'm curious about stuff. But it, I came up with two main questions that I wanted to find a way to study. One, embodied imagination inter increases interaction between dreamlike consciousness and waking consciousness. Does this enhance the creative process? First question. Second question, while increasing the interaction between dreamlike consciousness and waking consciousness, does embodied imagination induce this awakened mind pattern? Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop so we can have some in, uh, discussion if there is some. I'll tell you about the study next, but let's just pause for a moment and um, see if there's any questions, anything I didn't make clear, any ideas you have about anything I've said. Um, I found your book extremely fascinating. A couple of points. I think that what you're really talking about, um, you know, we can relate it in Western philosophy with Plato. I mean, you're talking about the platonic world or platonic cave of forms. Mm -hmm. These were actual entities. Yeah. And insofar as other groups developed in that direction, they really were following platonic thought. And then the division came with Aristotle, of course, and you have a whole second trajectory, if you will, from Aristotle and mm -hmm. Descartes. So I think that you know, we're coming back to Plato, as Jung was very much a follower of Plato as well. And the other thing I wanted to suggest, a couple of things, as far as, you know, Al Hobson's work was based on REM sleep. And talking about forebrain engagement, the greatest amount of REM sleep, which in the neonate is known as active sleep across all species, occurs right after birth. And there are no connections to the frontal lobe. So the brain does develop in a bottom-up uh, direction from a neuroscientific standpoint. But I think you know, it's unfortunate that we have this either-or type of situation because, you know, consciousness, I think, is so much more than just the physical brain or, you know, physical connections between neurons or even networks of neurons. And the whole idea of creativity, I mean, that is a very, um, you know, complex process that goes well beyond the physicality of the brain. And I think if we look at modern physics, and we take a look at what's going on at a quantum level, I mean, you know, we are, as you said, the brain is more of a sensory organ than anything else, but consciousness and the, the uh, imaginative process, the innovative process is so much more than all of that. And I think, you know, modern physics just is, is approaching this. We're not even getting into just how complex it is and what we really are able to do at a creative level. And the other thing I wanted to suggest is that, you know, consciousness and unconsciousness and the merging of the two that's one way of looking at it but i was a little surprised that you didn't mention interhemispheric communication which is very important in any creative process we are so left brain focused we are so analytically focused that we're really lacking a lot of the integration with the right hemisphere and in a creative process what you really see is the two hemispheres working in unison, working in conjunction with one another. And it's when we get input, a great deal of input from the right hemisphere into the left hemisphere and an acknowledgement at some level 
you see a real innovative and creative process. And what I love about the mind mirror is it's one of the few devices that's ever broken up activity between the two hemispheres to allow us to even look at the two hemispheres working together or not working together. And the relative intensity of activity across the hemispheres. So I, I think, you know, we can go a lot further than what even you presented. The other thing I wanted to say is the Tao system also considers, you know, dreaming to be other states of being and, and it's actual, you know, astral travel. You're actually going to other dimensions in a dream uh, scenario. And what you describe as a, a waking process to get into the dream is a form of lucid dreaming. It's a form of active lucid dreaming. Mm -hmm. Rosalind Cartwright has talked about that in terms of using that for women who have been abused or in bad relationships to go back into the dream and actually change the dream, change the ending consciously. So I think that you know, there is so much more uh, that you're describing, but also we can even go further. There's a lot more that, you know, we're, we're not even touching, I think. Just a couple thoughts come to mind, Deborah. Thank you for all of that. That's, um, you know, first of all, dreams don't only occur in REM sleep. So that idea, Absolutely. an old no, idea. No. So that, I didn't hear you say that. I just want activity is across all stages of sleep. You're absolutely correct. Right. The type of activity that we get from non-REM sleep is very analytical. It's, it's you know, it has a lot to do with day-to-day. -day. And our ability to retrieve it by verbal recall from delta sleep is minimal. That doesn't mean nothing's going on. It means we're, we're not able to really retrieve it from a verbal standpoint a lot of times, unless it's one big Im image of some sort. But when you start to talk about Al Hobson's you know, theory, you really do have to talk about REM sleep because he was really talking about the activity in REM sleep and what that was about. Um, but I totally agree with you. Yes, there's some sort of activity, mental activity going all across. And the other thing that came to mind was just an image. I, I think it's, it's the school of the philosophers. I think it's Raphael where there's Plato, Plato pointing up, Aristotle pointing down. And I think yeah. there we are. There's, there's the awakened mind right there. There's the two of them <laughs> you know, That's cool. demonstrating it physically. Yes, yes. That's very cool. Yes, yes. You know, Richard, I'm, I'm loving what you're doing here, and I'm utterly fascinated by um, the brain networks. Will you go back to that a little bit and say a little bit more about that? This is something that we don't usually look at, but I think it's incredibly important. These two brain networks, default mode, which is self-generated internal thought, imagination, dream, executive control network, alert waking, more and more it's looking like the default mode network is somehow where the creative process needs to include this. Now, it's the interaction of those two networks, though, that becomes um, probably foundational to, to the creative moment. I think it would be so easy. I mean, they, look, they're having jazz improvisationalists hooked up to fMRI machines and, and high density EEG machines while they're improvising to think couldn't you at the same time just look at the sort of the kind of Cade's idea of the kind of integration of frequency levels it would be so simple to do and why no one has ever done it I don't know it would be such a, an illustrative thing to do because I think what you'd find probably is that the same thing is happening what Cade is calling awakened mind what these researchers are finding in terms of integration of these networks, it would be a very rich place for people who have lots of gizmos to go and start studying. So would you um, correlate the default mode network to uh, theta and delta in terms of frequencies, or is this something we're talking about that's independent of a correlation to frequencies? Well, it's hard to know. I think that, that, would, be, that would be certainly one of the questions that you just look and say, frequency-wise, what's happening at that time? What's happening when your mind is in this mind-wandering, imaginal dreaming state? Default mode network is engaged. Now we know, or I'll show you in a while, when people are engaged in doing embodied imagination, when they're engaging the dream world, 
they are going into an awakened mind state. So I think it would be certainly a theoretical possibility, but it's, it's, that's what it is, a theoretical possibility. And the brain is so complicated that I think anything we say about it is probably oversimplifying, but I would wonder the same thing, say, well, you know. And you know, something else that strikes me about this is that um, nowadays we're really hearing a lot from um, neurofeedback people who have particularly open minds and are looking at uh, meditation and healing. Uh, they're saying that uh, the healing is occurring in the default mode network. And they're saying they're correlating it down to low frequencies. They're saying that um, when you get down to one hertz and below even two hertz, they're saying the nervous system is in two hertz. They're saying that's where where the body resets itself and uh, starts to regenerate energy. Yeah, right. Even lower frequencies than that. They're looking at waves way even lower than the delta frequency band. So point one and you get whole waves propagating right across the cortex. So the cortex can actually be in a quiet mode, a, a really quiet mode, and you not really get much signaling at all. That doesn't mean that nothing's taking place. And in I've seen this in extremely experienced meditators, particularly transcendental meditators, where the whole cortex literally goes quiet, which I find fascinating. I mean, it goes quiet. Now, that probably is in a default mode, but what is that all about? I mean, you know, Richard, you were describing these as on-off systems. They're really not necessarily. Multiple systems can be on at the same time, but they're on at different levels. And we see that in a, a really peculiar um, form of sleep which is where you have the delta sleep parasomnias. These, you know, these people are very deeply asleep and they get up and walk, okay? Uh, they're not too coordinated, that's right, but they can do a lot of things. Sometimes we would call it automatic behavior, but I mean, you know, if you have a, a child that sleepwalks during delta sleep, you've got to block stairways and everything else because they will attempt to go out the door if they can. So at some level, there are multiple networks that are simultaneously still operating, but they're at different levels. So it's not so much an on-off system as it is a level system. Um, you know, the networks are there, but they're there at different levels. And, you know, certain ones are dominant. But I would agree that it would be the default network that is most dominant in meditation. And because it's the loss of the ego. And I think the ego really belongs to the executive state. And once you lose the ego, then all that creativity is able to come through. The ego is almost like a box that encases everything. Wouldn't you say? I mean, that's how it was looking to me. And when we go into a default state, what do we lose? The sense of me, the sense of I. We become one with whatever we're with. I mean, we don't have a real awareness of separation. Wouldn't you say that? Perhaps. If we just take mindfulness practice, for instance, mm -hmm. and you're looking at focused attention meditation, like focusing on the breath, for instance, having that singular focus, versus open awareness meditation, where you're really now aware of anything that is arising. In open awareness meditation, you have the same thing happening. These two networks start to be concurrently engaged. That's not true in focused attention meditation. And, not surprisingly, open awareness meditation has a correlation with, the creat with creativity that focused attention doesn't, which makes sense to me. So what I'm doing with people with dreams, you can do just as well in meditation. It's, but again, the, there's the concurrent activation of these two, two networks. And again, it's, it's like brain waves. I mean, no network is ever completely turned off. But, you know, when you're in predominantly a waking beta state, how much uh, theta is there? Less. It's not turned off, but it's less. You may all know this, but there's a wonderful YouTube where Ken Wilber has an old mind mirror, and he basically flatlines his brain. It's really quite impressive. He just goes, boop, there's no, no, nothing there. He says, now watch this, boom. So just Google Ken Wilber YouTube, Ken Wilber brainwaves. And, and well, you don't even need, you could put mind mirror, but you don't even need it. But he's got this old mind mirror and he's just demonstrating flatlined 
<laughs> brainwave states. So. Oh, wow. Okay, great. No, that's great. <laughs> so thank you for this, um, Richard. This is fascinating. So tell us now about what you did with this hypothesis of yours, um, wherein you, as I understand it, uh, went in with the idea that embodied imagination and awakened mind with everything turned on at the same time could be the same thing. Right. Well, first of all, so you can imagine this. So first, this is a naturalistic study. I had seven participants, all of whom were engaged in something that, these are people who are doing something that is really important to them. <laughs> imagine this. Imagine I show up when you're in the midst of one of your most treasured, important projects, and I say to you, look, I've got this wild way of working the dreams, and I would like to do this while you're doing it. I'd like to insert myself into your most treasured project. Would you like to do that? As you can imagine, many people were very interested, and then they kind of freak out and say, no, I don't want to do that. Thank you very much. But I did find seven brave souls who said, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And then we, it's a simple two-step process. You could make this a 10-step process, a 20-step process. You could do this for the rest of your life. But I created a two-step structure. The first session was what I called induction. I invited people to simply recall an exemplary moment when they did not feel that they were creative, when they were working on their project and it was not moving, right? Now, that's very easy. Anybody who's worked on any project knows that happens most of the time. The number of times when we're really flowing is actually, for most people, much less. That memory, we work that as if it was a dream, in the same way I talked about before. So we just considered this memory a dream, we went back into the memory, we embodied it, we created this composite. So there was, you know, the dream, it, now you have these embodied states with the instruction, practice this for 20 minutes a day, do this for 30 to 60 seconds before you sit down with your project, then just forget about it. Do your project whatever way you're doing it. Also do it before you embody this before you go to sleep as a kind of a dream incubation strategy. So that was the first session. A week later, they came back and I asked them to record any dreams that happened between the first and the second session. They came back the second session and we worked on a dream that had emerged in just the way I, in the same way that I described before. The thing we did this time though is I recorded their I just hooked them up to a mind mirror, used it as a recording device, and just for curiosity, what would happen? Would they go into an awakened mind state? Then, in the, the data I collected, I asked them phenomenologically, just describe their experience, what impact did this have on the creative process? As best as I could, I tried to quantitate it, I just asked them for subjective reports of how effective was this, and then I collected the, mind, the EEG data from the mind mirror and looked, was there an awakened mind pattern? I also looked at gamma synchrony. Was a gamma synchrony pattern in place? I hope I've explained that well enough. I can go back to it if anybody needs me to. Um, so here are my study participants. There, there's three females, four males, most of them kind of middle ages. The oldest was 70, the youngest was 25. There was a poet, an engineering professor writing an engineering textbook, a musician, composer, a psychologist writing an autobiography, philosophy professor writing a philosophy book, an organizational specialist in the midst of a major life transition. And I wanted to include creativity as everything. It's not just creating a poem. It's I'm trying to figure out the creative solution to my life transition. So that was present, the graphic designer uh, using the mobile, designing a mobile device app. So we went through this process, and then I asked them, I'm, I know this is a very busy slide, I'll just read a little bits of this to you. I asked them that for their phenomenological, their first person experiences. On, the, um, on this side of the screen, we have the memory of the block. So if we look at participant number one, a poet, go back to a moment when poetry is not moving. So what she remembered was a feeling of being disconnected, arm he arms heavy, heart feeling sad. So we went into that, and then the dream, then the dream emerged from that, and her comment here, so we're gonna move this again. It was like a moment of amazement, a release from stuck linear patterns in a connected state where inspiration flows. Um, number four was a psychologist, I think that was my psychologist working on her autobiography. A feeling of being dumb and able to express myself was the memory. The creative energy went woohoo. I was attracted to the writing. I was in the flow creativity, creatively and with the writing. 
my graphic designer sitting at my desk, overwhelmed and stuck with nowhere to go with the project, feels like spinning in my head after. It's like a back door into the process, like going into my subconscious, like piecing to a puzzle together and things manifest. Am I making this up? I mean, I like that comment. It's like, really, is this happening to me? Um, so all of them, all seven people, um, well, I'll show you here. I then asked them, I said, just rate, how effective was this? How effective was this on your creative project? In terms of making it move, getting in the flow, I asked them a number of different things, but this is kind of a composite of that. The green is the induction. Said, did the induction help? Just going back to the memory and doing that, did that help? And actually there was a range. Some people said none, a little, some, much. One person said it was very helpful, just that alone. The dream had more impact, so the dream was here. So everybody said the dream helped. One person said some help, four, much help, two, very much help. So, you know, it's, a, it's not a perfect quantitative way to do this, but this is, again, the impacts that they had subjectively. Then I looked at their mind mirror data. So what we have here, I'll exp so this is percent compliance at demand level five. So there's 100% to 0%, and these are all the different phases. These bars are a composite of the seven participants. So what we have here is we have the highest score, the lowest score, the median. So this, so this is the average for, for each of these segments. So this right here is just talking at the beginning. It's a baseline measure. Here we are just talking about this or that, getting ready to go. Once the embodied imagination process starts, this is a sensing practice. And then these, these are going into the kind of transits we were talking about. So clearly, <laughs> their percentage of time in, at demand level five in awakened mind goes way up in the embodied imagination process. Here, we drop back down. This is the end of the session. The session ends here. We go back, we're just chatting again. Chat, chat, chat about what happened, how was it, all the rest of it. Then I invite them to go back to re-embody the composite, these somatically anchored states. Just go back into those states, feel them in your body again, and you see the awakened mind pattern again is evoked. Wow, so, wow. So we, you know, just bing, bing. And then, uh, looking at gamma synchrony, we get the same thing. You know, we have baseline, the embodied imagination process, gamma synchrony, back down to just talking again, and then back to embodying the composite. So this thing that they're practicing, this becomes a useful way to sort of, between sessions, say, practice this. Can I, I can now induce an awakened mind state, a gamma synchrony state, um, you know, by using these embodied composites. As, as a method to do that. What happens typically with these embodied states? They deteriorate over time. I mean, my own experience is they'll be, if you really go into if this, if you really engage this process, these anchors are in your body and they are strong. So for probably a week or so, I can feel them very, very powerfully. And then they just sort of decay and they're kind of gone after a while. But that, at least for me, that first week or so, it's very, very easy to re-engage that state. Um, now, this, again, Judith, you could talk much more about this than I can, just about gamma waves. There's increases in lucid dreaming. Moments of creative insight, that, that illumination stage, increase in gamma. Expert meditators have more gamma. Mystical states, more gamma. So gamma is a bit mysterious. I, I tried to write this paper up. I have written it up. I've submitted it. I didn't even include gamma because it was just too hard to discuss. It was already, it was already getting beyond the beyond for you know for usual you know places where you publish things and so the gamma states what actually we're doing with a mind mirror what we're measuring with gamma coherence how that compares to all the other things we know about gamma it just became unwieldy in terms of trying to explain that so i just i left it out but it's there um so the conclusions best as i could tell embodied imagination was effective for the creative process people benefited from it and while engaging, they entered uh, the awakened mind state and gamma synchrony at higher levels and baseline. So I leave you with Einstein. Logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. Um, that's great. So uh, that's all I want to say, or that's all I, I mean, that's all I have in terms of the formal presentation. You know, um, it it seems to me that what you what you were really doing when you were having people 
um, move down into their theta to remember the dream, to mm -hmm. work on the block was undoubtedly an awakened mind pattern. That is exactly how we work with individuals to, uh, to help them with any kind of block and psychological, mild traumas, uh, questions, issues, challenges of every sort. It's just a, it's a, it's not, it's not even a parallel, really. It's the exact same mm -hmm. process. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just fascinating that you um, have this, furthermore, have this uh, theory, as do we, about brain networks engaging simultaneously uh, mm -hmm. to move people into a peak performance state of mind in which they can work on um, issues and blocks. And boy, I sure hope you can get this thing published. And I sure hope we can get some funding to get some fMRI studies. Um, yeah that would be a heck of an adjunct to, uh, to the next study that you do that's similar to this. Yeah, it would, Judith, it would be. I, I know that other people have questions as well. If I may ask a question, I wanted to get a little clearer about the actual way the study worked. So first of all, how did you get people to uh, do lucid dreaming? I mean, whether people can remember their dreams. I understand that they came in with a creative block, and I understand that um, that you, while having them hooked up to the mind mirror, uh, were taking them back into the dream and working through the dream, but how did you get them to dream? Well, see, Judith, I didn't, there was no instruction, and I don't think any of these dreams were lucid dreams. So these are just dreams. I simply asked people to record their dreams. Whether there was any lucidity or not really wasn't the focus. So the part of this that is lucid dream-like is actually the embodied imagination process itself, where, you know, because again, in lucid dreaming, you're re-engaging your frontal network. So I, I think it's probably very similar to what I was doing, except it's happening spontaneously in a lucid dream. So these were just ordinary dreams that people had. And you know, sometimes people would have lots of dreams, so they would bring five dreams, and the challenge is to say, well, which one of these do we choose? And the rule of thumb there is to choose the one that is most alien to waking awareness, the one that just seems the most out there and wild. And people, most people can do that very easily. When I say to them, which of these dreams seems the most unusual, the most provocative, the one that just, you know, really is out there. Let's, let's work with that one. Um, you know, uh, it's been my theory for a long time that uh, lucid dreaming is an awakened mind pattern. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you've just proved this. Uh, well, you have just proved it, actually, by having them revisit the dream while they were uh, more conscious than non-conscious as they would have been during the actual dream state. Um, the thing that I think would probably be different, Judith, would be that in a lucid dream, that would be different than what I'm doing. I think there would be overlaps. In a lucid dream, you still don't have access to external sensory inputs. You still don't have access to memory or much less access to waking memory. So there would be, but I do think there's a general state that would probably have some overlaps, but probably also, you know, I, I would, you know, probably call this lucid waking rather than lucid dreaming, knowing that the lucidity the overlap is the quality of lucidity. Yes. You know, that makes me uh, think of something else. So the, the terminology uh, is uh, uh, maybe not so lucid to many people, the idea <laughs> of embodied imagination. I wonder why it's not. Um, is, it the, is it called that because the dream is the part that's embodied and then you reimagine it? Because otherwise it would seem like the it ought to be called something like um, embodied uh, awakening or embodied uh, reimagining or something. Well, I think because it comes... The reason, I'm, the reason I'm saying this is because imagination itself has such a negative connotation. Very mm -hmm. often it means, oh, you just imagined it. It wasn't real. Right. So, exactly. And, and Henri Corbin was trying to underscore he used the word imaginal versus imaginary because imaginary has that connotation. It's just imagination. You're just dreaming. 
as opposed to I've entered into a world of imagination that contains subtle bodies, you know. Yes. You could also call it embodied imaging. If you use the term imaging, it is not treated with imagination or imaginary or even embodied waking imaging because you, you are teaching them to actually physically, sensorily, sensorially <laughs> embody whatever is there. Mm -hmm. Become one with whatever is there. Again, it's getting rid of the ego, eliminating the ego completely, and becoming one with what is around you. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, the terminology, I, I mean, I feel beholden to Robert who created it. It's his terminology. It's his kind of thing. So, But I hear what you're saying. Imagination. I think he's well, well aware of that. So, you know, but it's called embodied imagination. It probably will be called that forever. Other names are good, too. Richard, I love your study. It's great. It's a great beginning. And it is extremely impressive. I have great fun doing this. Now this sort of... I wonder uh, if other psychologists or psychiatrists could be taught these techniques and might be willing to take this up because there are quite a few mind mirror owners who are psychologists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the technique itself is, is um, like any technique. There are certain principles that one follows. The actual doing of it, um, I mean, you know, the, the training program I had was over three years. It was relatively intensive. And so it takes you a while to really become comfortable immersing yourself in an imaginal world and being there. It sounds so simple, but there's such a tendency to want to understand things, to, to move away from what is mysterious and inexplicable and just to be there with it and just let it unfold, let whatever emerges emerge. And again, for this group, I don't think that would be much of a challenge. It's probably what you do in many ways, but for a lot yeah. of people, that's really a challenge. They want, to, they want to understand things, they want to encapsulate things, they want to make things rational, and that ruins the whole thing. You know, it just takes you out of what's happening to say, oh, I had no idea this would emerge. This is so surprising to me. I couldn't, I couldn't have imagined this is what I would conclude. And yet here I am with this experience, you know. So anyway, but it's a, it's a good idea. Most people would not be that dedicated, I don't think. I just was, I don't know. Honestly, you know, I went to a talk by Robert. I had never heard of this guy before. And um, I thought, gee, this is so interesting. And I said, I, I, he happened to walk into the, into the, dining room in the morning where I was grabbing a cup of coffee and I said oh hi it was a great talk do you ever do workshops he said oh well I do workshops you know sometime but really I have this what I'm all I've got right now is I have a three-year training program we're starting next month but we're probably full and I said great sign me up <laughs> I mean I had no idea I was ever going to do this it just it happened that quickly it was like oh what a good idea you know? I think uh, one of the uh most interesting things that you found in this study uh, was the arousal of gamma, mm -hmm. which of course is associated with an aha insight every bit as much as the awakened mind pattern is associated with the aha insight. And, um, and as the information travels up, you're working in theta and delta, and as it travels up across that bridge into the conscious mind, that aha just stimulates that gamma. And, um, and it's, it's really fascinating that you found that when you weren't talking, you weren't working in the embodied imagination, it was low, mm -hmm. and then boom, up it goes. Right. It's just a brilliant study. We would love to publish it on the website, MindMirror website under the research and under MindMirror studies. But when the time comes, when you're willing to yeah. release it, we would absolutely love to include it. Because I can tell you, I know quite a few people offhand right now um, who will uh, be very excited to read it. Well, thank you, Richard, unless there are any other questions. I think you've satisfied us all. So if we have no other questions, um, I want to thank you, Richard, for a, a most fascinating webinar. Uh, I, I see everyone nodding, and um, it, it was just terrific. And thank you especially for the ideas about the brain networks and uh, for your vision that saw that networks and the awakened mind pattern and uh, the wonderful techniques that you're using uh, to help people clear blocks 
are actually waking people up. <laughs> may, may we continue to awaken through people like you. Thank you so Thank very you. much. Thank yes. you very much, Richard. It was a great talk. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank I you. appreciate the invitation. We hope to see you again. Take care, everybody.